This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome once again to the Sunset Safari here in Juma in the Sabi Sands, South Africa, where it is a very nice 29 degrees Celsius, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And well, we are with the Duke of Juma, who has been lying up around Treehouse Dam for the whole day. And just before we went live, he's decided to get up and start moving. How splendid is that? But what is interesting about it is he started scent marking. And the line that he's on right now is, is pretty much a few meters to the right of the line that Hukumuri came down last week. Straight down here to Treehouse Dam, Hukumuri came down this pathway but went on that side of it. Went straight across down to the hyena den. And so Tingana has waited for the sunshine. He's waited for it to dry up. And now he is doing his territorial duties in the middle of the day which is just, it boggles the mind sometimes. It's probably to do with the fact that it is so windy. You can see the vegetation is blowing as we go. And he's probably been waiting for a long time to do this, but he's been quite hungry. So we've got a TV show this evening. Actually had Hoyley come out and spend many hours with Tingana. Him and BK came out, had a bit of a bro session out here, which was quite nice. And Tingana attempted two female kudus, large kudus, uh, but he missed. So he's definitely hungry. And um, he's also scent marking as he goes, but I think he needs a meal in him. His belly is looking very, very empty. And uh, he got a little bit of a... a I'm not sure if it was a wound on the head. We didn't see anything earlier. Those of you who were with me this morning, we didn't notice anything on his head, but there was a bit of blood on the head just now, possibly from a tick that he might have scratched. We're going to get a little bit closer in and see if we can see that and see if it is a wound, in fact, or if it is just a tick that he managed to scratch off and it's his own blood burst onto the surface. But um, when the wind is like this, it cools things down and it makes the stealth movements of leopards even more proficient. Okay, well, we're going to be spending the afternoon with Tingana because he is just the Duke and a wonderful character. We love him so. Don't forget, you can get in touch with us on hashtag Safari Live on the YouTube chat stream. But in the meantime, let's go all the way up to the Maasai Mara to say good afternoon to Isaac. Welcome to Masai Mara, everyone. From windy situation in Kruger to more windy areas in the Mara. I have Topis here with me. Welcome this afternoon, everybody, to this afternoon's game drive. My name is Isaac, and on camera I have G. Andre. Welcome to the Masai Mara. It's a bit windy, but all in all, we are happy that you can join us this afternoon on this afternoon's game drive. It is such a beautiful scene I have here. I have lots and lots of topi. It's not always that I come across this big herd of topi like this everywhere this time of the year and the main reason is that they are migra migratory animals. They do go to the Serengeti for the annual migration and then come back but we do have you know small resident herds that stick around and as you can see lots of young ones a lot of those, these young ones were born in um, October. From October, they start giving birth. And behind there, I have Impala also. It's very windy, as you can tell. You know, the grass is moving very fast. And also, I think you might hear it from my microphone. The topi is an antelope only found in East African plains. And they amount to around 20 to 30,000 during the migration. In case you're not aware of what I'm talking about, the Great Migration is an annual movement of animals from southern Serengeti in Tanzania to Kenya. It involves uh, the wildebeest, zebra, topi, um, eland, nomadic cats that move in one direction, moving for about 500 kilometers one way. At the moment, majority of them are way down in the Serengeti, a place called um, Nabi. That's where they go give birth. So that is what is called the Great Migration. And this, and this animal, you know, usually migrates. You know, from my active 
um, Toppy with me here. Let me t send you to Trish, who's got a sleeping lion. Good afternoon, everybody. So glad to have you on board as usual. Trishala here from Juma in South Africa, as always, and I've caught up with my lovely Avoca male yet again. Now, there is a second male hanging around, and he's just in the bushes off to the right, but we don't actually have a visual of him with the camera, but I can see him with my eyes just off to the right behind these bushes. You won't be able to see it at the moment, but I'm going to reposition maybe a little later and be able to show you, hopefully. Now, we are in the middle of the road, and there is a car behind us. So, uh, well, you know what? It's not as if he, the car can do anything if the lion's in the middle of the road, so... Okay, good. They've decided to take another route. <laughs> so he's kind of capitalized on all the shade here on the road while we, BK and I, BK is on camera with me, uh, while we have to suffer in the sun. But uh, he has found all the shade and has decided that he's going to take it all, haven't you? Well, you deserve it. We know that you're not yourself, you're a little bit injured. So there you go, you can have the shade for now. Rain covers are off and the sun is out. So hopefully we can get some really nice shots and have some really nice sightings. I'm sure we will. Now he hasn't moved far at all. He, where he was uh, in the morning was, is not even a hundred meters from here. Less than that by far. Now, if he would let me get past then I could show you the other male in the bushes. But this is quite exciting to have them both around. I think that kind of maybe settles what we were, what we were thinking about, the reasons he could be injured. So if the other male is around, maybe he, he has not had a fight with them. Anyway, I am going to try and reposition so we can get a view of the other male. In the meantime, let's go to David in the Mara. Uh, very well done, Trish, to have spotted a lion. And we got one grumpy animal here and not sure why I would say he is grumpy, but hopefully he's gonna settle down and try and behave. And to all of you, Jumbo Jumbo, my name is David Azusho, and with me on camera is Achi. Achi, how are you, sir? Very good. I think today might be one of those weekends that we call the weekend of the Big Five, because I think I heard Steve talking about Tingana, maybe. He must have seen a leopard. And now Trish with the lion, and myself now with the buffalo. So we've got three of the big five. So can we have some work today? Our all presenters are gonna request them. We work on the big five because this buffalo here is one of the big five. And as Trish correctly said, is one of the most grumpy animals. Now it's very windy here where we are. You can see how the grass is moving and it shows you how windy it is. And that's why these grumpy animals here don't look very comfortable. Can you see the grass there? We think, or I think, we might be getting rains maybe tonight or tomorrow. This is how it starts. These are the signs of rain. And I believe Isaac, Trish, and Steve already told you, keep talking to us. Any comments, just send them to us. Ask me, why do I think that grass is moving left and right? Is that grass or wheat? Any questions, please do send them. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So we got some one work, one good work to do, and uh, got the buffaloes and uh, yeah, Trish with the lion, Steve uh, with the leopard. Now let's work on the big five before long, and let's go back, I guess, to Tingana with Steve Ovo. Welcome back. Tingana is on the top of the Termite Mound, and I do apologize. I got so carried away with the fact that we have a moving leopard in the afternoon, and I forgot to introduce myself and Mr. Sebastian Rombi on the camera. So I'm Steve, of course, and that's Tingana, and he is definitely on the move. He's now on top of the Termite Mound, having a look, see if anything's moving in the long grass, apart from all the trees and the grasses. Everything is swaying. 
Um, and with his very keen vision, he's trying to see if there's anything just stumbling around that he can maybe try and move towards. It's such a characteristic thing that we see. I'm sorry, he's suddenly hidden from view. Can I go back and meet us, Seb? Ah, oh, there we go. He knows. There he is. So can you see right on the top of his head, there's a bit of a blood stain there. I think it's just from a tick, because it's not seeping or anything. It's just a little bit of blood. I think it was from a tick that got squashed. There's another one on the top left of his head. Another big tick up there. And they get nice and gorged and full of blood um, before generally falling off to breed in the long grass to then give us enormous amounts of itching when we walk around. Um, but he caught that one, probably with his claw, and scratched it off. And that would have led to a little bit of a blood stain. Well, he's just coming down the termite mount. There he is. Hello, Tingi. You're all saying hello, Tingi. Well, yes, indeed. It's wonderful to be with him. I told you all he'd be back. And, well, what a good opportunity for him to be back as well to say goodbye to our season one of SABC3 that is on this evening. Sorry, Seb, I'm taking you through a little bit of a dead patch here. Naroko, he is a gorgeous boy. He's a He's getting a little bit old. You can see that in his face. His face and his fur, he's getting a little bit droopy skin. Can maybe do with a little bit of Botox or something. <laughs> I, don't, I don't advocate any of that. Can you imagine a leopard with Botox? <laughs> Sorry, the image, the image is just too much. <laughs> Tingana's not that vain. He doesn't mind. He knows he's getting on a bit. He's still a very powerful leopard, a very loud and confident leopard. And uh, he is walking directly e east. So he's coming back to the road called Weaver's Nest. And he is finding every conceivable bush he can find to uh, demarcate his territory. And interesting to see where he's going to lead us, what is on his mind. But it's not only myself and Trishala and Isaac and David out this afternoon. We've also got Sydney. He's on a vehicle and he would like to say good afternoon. So sorry about that guys, but I have found something great for us. I found another Avoca male. So I did tell you that he was in the bushes there and we managed to spot him. Now uh, he is, it's quite a thick block. And I think if I get in there, I'll be a bit too close to him. So I'm being a bit sensitive and I'm staying out here on the road. Now he's not too far from his brother. So like I was saying before, there's the brother. Dearest, sitting in the shade, hogging it all. Uh, as I was saying before, I hope this kind of um, puts to sleep the suspicions that we thought it may be in a coalition internal kind of fight because they are still around each other. They were sitting with each other as we drove up and then the one sat down on the road and the other walked across the road not too far at all. So to me, it seems that they're still uh, still quite a coalition and they don't have any sort of internal squabbles yet at least so what created the hole in his head still a question to be answered yes we're talking about you like I said it's become quite hot now in Juma 29 and 84 degrees Fahrenheit so everyone's looking for a bit of shade and I am too. So while I look for some shade, let's go over to Sydney who has some zebra.
What a beautiful sighting. I've got a lovely zebra standing right in the middle of the impala head. These two different species are feeding together this afternoon. And most of all, good afternoon and welcome on board. This is Sydney Fumurani Mikosi, and I'm traveling with Senzo Mkize, who is my camera operator this afternoon. We are going to definitely look for the interesting game for you this afternoon. You can talk to us by following us on twitter hashtag safari live you can also follow us on youtube chat stream so the weather this afternoon rain is still promising don't get surprised i'm still having the roof and you might get disturbed with the poles when viewing these animals so impalas and the zebras when they're feeding together like this they do help each other a lot when it comes to the identification of the uh, predators. So if you can check animals such as the zebras, they are very much popular of connecting with animals such as wildebeest because wildebeest has got a poor eyesight. But here I know both impalas as well as the zebras, they both got good eyesight. So it means any animal, any predator which might try to, oh, there's even a kudu here. I can see the kudu running away there. So it means it's not just the zebras here. So it's three different species. It's the kudus and zebras and the impalas. When animals are feeding like this, this is what is called safety in numbers because it's very much difficult for a predator to single one animal out when they are in a very big head like this. You can see some of these impalas are now feeding under the trees there. So now we are going to leave this uh, beautiful bachelor head of impalas and cross over to the Masai Mara where David is having something. Well, I was talking about the big five and I could be wrong here, but I think now we can close that chapter of talking about the big five because uh, after so the buffaloes I uh, just took one loop and came to this herd of elephants here which complete the list of the big five I'm sure most of you know what I'm talking about but just in case we got animals that we call the big five in Africa which are elephants buffaloes lions leopards and rhinos I apologize we still have one more to get to make that list complete of the big five now the wind continues hauling here, still blowing, and you can see through the grass, and this is the red oat grass. It's just being moved. And should we get any rains now, we would say we should get easterly rains coming this way in this direction. But I do not think there's any time now. It could be maybe tomorrow, the day after, but when these rains come, these elephants will still be here, but this, when these you know, rains come, nothing much is going to change. Now, we've got two seasons of rainfall in Kenya, the long rains and the short rains. So what we could be going into are the wrong lanes, and it could be at a time, you know, come March. But again, the weather has been very erratic the last couple of years, so it could come early or it could even come rather late. African elephants, we call them small herds of anything five sometimes up to a hundred of course when you get a hundred there'd be definitely different families coming together so if you look at that grass carefully where they're eating you notice it's a lot greener than the other grass surrounding that area and of course much shorter definitely more nutritious and secondly i would guess it has more moisture content in it Always very matriarchal, led by one female, a matriarch. And she'll always decide where to graze, where to browse, where to go have a drink, what time to go have a drink. She's like a commander. Now, 
This is very exciting. Now we have walked for the big five now. Let's see whether we can uh, get the rain at one point. And I lost to move on as just hauling and hauling uh, my, my ears because of the wind. And let's go back to the Duke of Juma, I think, with Steve Ovo. You can really see is a bit of his profile and very easy to see how thick that neck is, the dewlap. Well, he was walking through and uh, two steenboks, probably about 30 meters away, decided they were going to take a bolt and they both went in different directions and it caught his attention for a moment and stood up on a big log to see if he could find one. But that's the strategy with small antelope like that. They will run a short distance very quickly and then stand dead still. And well, I've just seen it and it's worked for them. A couple that is probably going to survive the day but he's still trying to find one. One went off in the direction he's now looking. The other one went off in the direction behind us. He tried to see where that one went, but I think it concealed itself quite nicely. Rosalind, you want to know how big a dewlap can get? And well, there we go. That's a, probably the best example. I mean, Tingana is an enormous leopard, and I think that's as good an example of a fully mature dewlap that I've ever seen. Um, not many other leopards that I've seen are as big as Tingana, but they all have a similar sort of size. But I've never seen anything bigger than what you see there with the Duke. So a very, very good example right there, Rosalind. Now he's headed straight. There's a couple of pans along the way here, but he is definitely hungry because he didn't drink at uh, Treehouse Watching Hole while we were there. He just kind of walked along after being in the shade. Maybe he enjoyed the tick off of his head. Child of the Universe, leopards would most certainly hunt a topi. I don't know if they'd manage an adult topi, um, but certainly the youngsters. But, you know, the, the idea behind the topi is that they are planes game. And their strategy is to be able to stand. And they're very vigilant animals. Uh, they ability to stand up tall and to, to look and be attentive. Um, the wildebeest often don't even notice predators approaching. The topi is very, very on top of things. And I think a leopard would have a hard trance trying to sneak up on a topi in their short grass habitats. But a young topi most certainly is at risk of a leopard. But I think with the vigilance of the adults, they probably be able to evade them. But leopards will hunt absolutely anything they can possibly get their claws or teeth into. I mean, David and Ralph both had leopards in the Mara last year with small giraffe up the trees. So now that is something that you just wouldn't think would be possible for a leopard. But they are opportunistic. And if they can catch it and bring it down, they most certainly will. For example, he'll go for a bird. He'll go for a snake. He'll go for anything that is catchable, even tortoises. From time to time, and you're going to walk up to the water. Is that the water is gross. This is so muddy. Are you going to have a drink, boy? Yes, he is. There we go. Look at the size of his feet. I honestly wish I could just give him some of my water because, because of the erosion from the rainfall, it's filled that little pan with a fair amount of sediment, a fair amount of runoff and mud. There we go. It, prefer this to treehouse watering hole it seems and there you can see how long the whiskers are I was asked a question this morning is why are leopards whiskers longer than lions and I wonder if anyone out there can answer for me are they in fact longer than lions or do they just stand out a bit more on a leopard's face because of the colors and the spots it's not something I've really paid attention to in the past but now looking up close at the large head and face of Tingana you can see how enormously long his whiskers are as he drinks up the entire pan. We're very, very blessed to be able to spend time with these animals in close proximity. Okay, well, let's quickly go up to the Masai Mara where Gigi has moved off from large buffalo to baby buffaloes running. Lovely. Anytime you'd see a cat drinking, I think, uh, Steve, you feel very lucky to see the, you know, Duke of Juma doing that. But I got some more buffaloes from the two or three that I saw earlier. Now I got a bigger group that you would call a herd of buffalo here that is getting very confused by the wind. Most of the herbivores, when it gets very windy, 
it brings a bit of anxiety in them in the sense that they know the cats will always be trying to go get hold of them and their hearing is not very accurate their smell also the smell don't smell very very good so they're always a bit careful when it's windy like this but now why i stopped here is because there were two small little calves well that buffalo has a short tail and you see that small baby there and see how clever they are they'll always put their young ones in the midst of the group and i think that's the mother who is walking very close to the calf so the wind brings lots of confusion to these animals because all their senses do not work accurately and they have known out of experience animals or predators like lions will always be taking that advantage to get them. Not sure you can hear the wind blowing from where we are, me and Archie. Archie is my camera operator this afternoon. And all those small little birds you're seeing flying on top of those buffaloes are called the ox pickers. Linda, how are you today? And you say they are so very cute. And Linda, especially to see them with the wind blowing there, makes them, I guess, even cuter. Not sure that's an English word, but I think that makes them even more cuter to see the wind blowing. And see the size of that small little baby there. Thank you, Archie. But the mother is very, very cautious because even a thing, you see how they keep turning their heads they would not know what direction any danger would come from. You see how they smell? You see that one putting her nose up? Yeah, it's just to pick up any smell because they know now the hearing senses are, I would say, almost not, not to count on. They better count on smell. Of course, if the wind is... Ryan, I got a question there from Ryan, why that buffalo is something, and the same wind is blowing to my ears and making me miss that question. So what she's trying to do is to smell, see whether, you know, she can pick any smell of lions or anything. The Ryan, very good question, and you'd like to know whether buffaloes are native to Africa. Yes, Ryan, uh, buffaloes are native to Africa, and exactly that's why we call them the African Cape buffaloes. They've been found here, and I think when some of the Europeans came way back uh, at the beginning of the century to South Africa, and I think there's an area called Cape, no, not sure how far it is from Cape Town, because we call these buffaloes the African Cape buffaloes. Yes, they're native here, and we will compare them to the bisons, also to the water buffalo, which you'll get maybe in Asia and North America. Well, I need to move. This particular area is an area I call the Sausage Republic. And Sausage, I'm talking about, about a particular pride of lions. I want to give you one more quick look of, that, of those buffaloes because I am enjoying how the wind is bringing them some worries. And I want to move move some some uh, lions here in this particular area you see the small little calf is just following the mother very quick closely not to make uh, any mistakes well talking of buffalo calves small babies of a buffalo i think isaac got small babies of a type of bird yes i'm talking about wind it is also very windy here and I think it's an advantage to certain animal and others are a very big disadvantage. Over here, I have the female ostrich with her five chicks. This is an ostrich that uh, we know from, from quite a while. She had about 10 chicks. She has lost five and the five she's had, she's, hold on to, she's been holding on to them for the last about three months and they're doing quite fine. So we're very, very happy. We're hoping to see them reach maturity. This is the Maasai ostrich and this is a female. It's quite an unusual setting because usually you come across a pair and the chicks, they take care of their chicks. I don't know what happened to the male. We haven't seen him since December. Uh, maybe he decided to abandon the family which is rather sad because they usually try and bring up the chicks together until they're almost um, quite big, quite you know mature and then they leave. But uh, we don't know exactly what happened to the male. Looks like um, she's a quite a clever, you know, clever mother because she's do moving downwind. So in case of any threat, she can see it and uh, nothing will attack her. 
But remember to join me in conversation on hashtag Safari Life, or you can, you know, watch us on YouTube live stream. Um, we can ask us as many questions as possible. Uh, is it? Um, I don't. I didn't get your name, but uh, you did ask. You know, how many eggs do ostriches lay? They say a female ostrich can lay up to four eggs in a day. Aren't um, yes, that's uh, if I got your name right. Yeah, they do lay about you know four. And what happens is that when a female is ready after mating to uh, lay some eggs, she will lay the eggs. She'll find a spot on the ground and then she'll lay an egg. The rest of the females that have been mating with the same male will follow suit and lay eggs in the same spot. So in a nest, you can find up to 60 eggs, 60, 60, zero. But of those 60, maybe. 40 will hatch after incubation of about three months and then of those 40 maybe 15 will reach maturity infant mortality is very high because of extreme sunlight too much water thirst um, you know jackals leopards lions will also go for the chicks so the mortality rate is very high at a very young age but yes if i th i hope i answered your question right um, they look like they are very happy this these guys Gemma, you ask me how long do chicks stay with their moms? They will stay sometimes even forever. Um, they will stay forever um, sometimes, uh, but when they are big enough, like mature, to start mating, if the flock is too big, they might break away. So they will stay even up to two, three years before the flock getting too big and then break away. But I have seen where they stick with their moms, you know, for forever they become part of the big big family this is a beautiful setting um, and this is coming to you from the Masai Mara and these guys were once you know under serious threat a few years back when there was a lot of butterfly girl you ask me you know if we know how many ostriches are found in the Mara of course we don't know these are um, you know birds or you know animals that they hard to, you know to keep track of uh, so I don't know I wouldn't lie to you it's an animal we don't keep track so I don't know how many but we do have a very healthy population as you can see we have chicks right now this is not the case that you know and about 10 years ago where you didn't see them because everybody was having an opening ostrich farms and so people came and stole eggs but there, have, there has been restrictions on who can have ostrich farms and so we have seen a very healthy population of ostriches coming back so don't you worry I don't know the number but we do have a very good population of the Maasai ostrich I'll proceed on um, and see what else I can find for you because they have gone over the horizon and all I can share with you now is in this beautiful plains over here um, it's quite a huge expanse where I am very open and this is typical of Mara uh, these sides it's very 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 open um, you can okay while I continue uh, seeing what I can find for you let me send you to greater Kruger where Trish has got a lion for you guys Wow, just look at the way that mane is blowing in the wind. Hey, my gorgeous boy. Absolutely stunning. Now, the most heartwarming thing happened. They were, he was sitting on the road, the one with the, injured, the injury on his skull. And then the brother came out from the bushes and nuzzled him a few times, picked him up, and then sort of well not picked him up physically but sort of like helped him N they nudged each other and then it almost like he said come bro let's go have a drink and they've just stopped over somewhere you can see his mouth still wet and his brother sort of walked off to the right there oh look at that is that not the most beautiful thing Hey guy, get a good look at his teeth now.
absolute poser. I've just got my, my binos out, guys, so I'm just having a closer look. He's been struggling to keep up with his brother quite a bit. And his brother's been moving at a really slow, slow, slow pace to kind of just, I suppose, help him and guide him. But it was just the most heartwarming thing. He'd stop every now and then to make sure that this limpy one would catch up. It's just been the sweetest thing ever. Now he's just sort of flopped down in another patch of shade and his brother's moved off. But I I bet I could put money on the fact that that brother's not far off at all because he has been staying with him the whole time and trying to help him. Jonathan would like to know if he could actually be pushed out of the coalition if his injuries get worse. Um, I'm actually not sure. What I can tell you is, in my suspicion, uh, I don't think that will happen. I don't think so, but, you know, really, who knows? He could, the injuries could become so bad that he actually gets left behind, in which case the other two brothers just sort of move ahead and don't come back as opposed to being physically pushed out because of his injuries but being left behind that could that could definitely happen i think um but at the moment seeing this interaction with the two of them i don't think that's going to happen anytime soon because he's so concerned about his limping brother here i don't, i really don't think it's come to that yet I want to just angle myself a bit better. All the viewers say he looks so lazy. Well, that's a lazy lion for you. That's what they do in the day. Lays around, look for a bit of shade. You know, get the wind blowing through their mane. He's been resting a lot though. Even this morning when I saw him, he had not moved very much from that, from how, where I'd seen him the day before, which is not a great sign because usually what he should be doing is sort of patrolling his area, his territory and scent marking, especially after the rain, when most of it would have been washed away, he would go and re-scent mark all those areas and I haven't seen him doing it. Maybe he's just relying on his brothers for now. Okay, his brother is actually next to him on the other side. I'm going to reposition a bit and then, yeah, I'm going, because I can see him just kind of at the edge there. So I'm going to reposition, not going to get too close, but I want to just angle so we can see the brother as well. <laughs> Hello, boy. You're lifting your head up. There we go. BK, can you see him? Yeah? Dixon says bonds mean a lot to lions. They certainly do. They are the only cat that lives in such a type of social structure and with so much social bonding going on. So it is important. And that is kind of telling from their success. They're the apex predators and that's because very much, well, one of the reasons is because of their social bonds and the way they reaffirm these bonds and they kind of, you know, each member of the pride is valuable in some way. But I just love how he's waiting 
with their brother. And he, they, and I'm saying they're waiting because it's as if they're taking pit stops along the way just so that Limpy can sort of recuperate. David says they look like they're on a yoga diet. I don't even know what a yoga diet is. Is that just healthy, healthy veggies? That's not going to do much for you, is it? Oh, yogurt. <laughs> yogurt diet. Uh, even that's a bit far-fetched for them, but I think yoga diet was even worse. I think the one with the injury could do with some yoga. He looks so stiff when he gets up and he starts to move around and that back leg is looking really, really swollen. Not great signs, but he's got his brother around to help him. And you can see that he's super tired and he's just flopped down there, but the brother's still got his head up because I have a feeling they know exactly where they need to go or want to go because they missioned, they were really, really walking fast. They were not um, sort of wandering about, looking for a nice spot of shade, not at all. Well, these brothers are on a mission and apparently so is Isaac, so let's go to him. Welcome back. I'm driving aimlessly here, looking for something, but I haven't found. But even without anything, it is a lovely view that I have in front of me. I cannot complain. I know there will be something maybe up here, and I can see lots and lots of game. You know, long ways, there's a big herd of buffalo over there, maybe 300. There's a big you know, herd of eland across the other side, about maybe 30. So I'm not complaining. Um, I'll see something soon. The area I, I am in is called Eloi Plains. In our map of Masai Mara, we have different names for different areas. And this area is called Eloi. Eloi is a certain type of tree in Masai. It's medicinal and it's got prickly um, thorns that sometimes they cut it and use to build the corral so that they can protect the animals at night. I think it used to occur here. I don't see very many at the moment, but I you know that's the, the name of this area. If you have a map of the Masai Mara, just look out for that name and it will tell you exactly where I am. Uh, sometimes it's always nice to stop and you know have a look because sometimes you'll miss something when you are just uh, driving around so i'll just scan around while j andre also uses our you know camera to see if there is anything but you know scanning all around it is just a beautiful scene everywhere in front here it's just uh, miles and miles of beautiful endless plains uh, Okay, um, while we're scanning, and those actually are buffaloes. You see them over there? Those are buffaloes. And while I drive to get close to them, let me send you over to David. I hope he's getting lucky looking for the sausages. Once I jump out of the car for a change, because uh, when I was in Juma last year, I kept talking about the Marula trees, which were huge trees. But then I would like to show you one of the iconic trees of the Mara, and this is a fig tree. And first I want to show you how large these trees are. And if I do my both hands like that, I'm not even halfway the tree. And you can see, I need about myself and Archie and Isaac and Steve and Trishara for us to just go around that tree. Now, looking up on this tree, they make a very good shade. They're very solid trees. 
and they tend to remain green all around the year. It's still very windy if you look at the grass here, as Art is showing you how windy it is. But the reason mainly also I came down here it's because there's a branch that was brought down and I guess it's by the elephants and I want to pick it up because ideally we do not do this. It's quite heavy. Let me see whether I will manage to lift it up. And uh, that's too heavy. We also have a rule here that ideally you leave everything where you found it. But I will try and bring this particular uh, small little branch or twig here to show you how exactly the fig trees look like. Very popular with baboons, very popular with uh, particular birds like doves, pigeons, and Achi want me to come here. This is how they look like. Uh, at the moment, they are not ripe, but you've seen they make very good food. Also, for certain birds like turacos, this is what they tend to feed on. See that? So when they're ripe, they'll change the color and they'll either go to orange or that kind of uh, beautiful color. Now, I want to put, back it, put it back where it was because you remember earlier I said we always try to leave things where they are. That's how nature should be. And the only thing we should leave behind here are our footprints. Every time me and Isaac, we are talking of how tall the grass is here in the Mara, and sometimes you even can't see us because of the height of the grass and why it's so difficult to see the lions. I guess I'm about five, five feet something. Archie is definitely six. Archie is the camera operator who is showing you my face and what I'm doing out here. So I want to show you. This is the red oat grass, okay? Sometimes we also call it the Samenda Triandra. I'm five feet and a few inches aside, and I want to show you how high this grass is. So imagine looking for a lion would you be there, it makes life very difficult for us. But the rains are going to continue, so all this grass is going to continue. So I don't have my green shoe cars yet, because when it gets colder, I'll always uh, put it on. But if I sit here, with my green shuka, I'll just disappear. You'll not see me anymore. So that should be much later tonight. Well, back to business. I need to jump back in the car because as I had promised you before, I need to look for the sausages. Thank you, Achi, for your good job. You have made me have a little bit of a stretch. Maybe at one point we are going to uh, have a little change, so I have to get uh, myself and hook to the other radio, which is uh, where normally I belong. Thank you, Achi. Achi, I tell you, if you stand out on that wind, that wind might blow you out. Okay. Very good. Excellent. Now, it's time to look for my favorite cuts. And I have done enough exercise. Already. Very good. After having, having hugged the fig tree, let's go back to the Duke of Juma with Steve Ovo. Thank you, Gigi. Indeed, it is very powerful to hug a tree. I quite enjoy hugging trees on a daily basis, but indeed we are still with the Duke. And isn't that incredible how tall that red oat grass can get in the Mara there? I mean, at the height of David, he's not a small man. So you can imagine how everything would disappear up here if we had the same sort of growth. That's all to do with the rain and the soil, hugely nutrient rich soil providing a hugely nutrient-rich vegetation. But it's not always ideal when you're searching for lions in the long grass. Most certainly wouldn't be the most fun area to walk in with the grass that long. Well, Duke is slowly, slowly making his way towards Chelapan. He knows there's always a couple of animals hanging around over here. And he's been taking his time, showing us the patience that is the Duke of Juma. And he's stopping right in front of us. Here he is, right above my head. Hello. <laughs> he's looking at Chelapan. He's looking for 
because there's always a couple of impala hanging around over here. Generally just in the open area, just behind us. Hmm, you probably could make him wear a hat, Emma. I mean, Seb was saying earlier, because we were sitting next to him, and Seb was saying, this is the highlight of my job. We were sitting there, and uh, Seb was eating some nuts, and Tingana was right next to the car in the shade, and said, Seb said, this is the best part of my job, getting to sit here with a leopard while having a snack. And he also said, after that, I wish they were, we could go up and just cuddle them, because they just look so cuddly, don't they? <laughs> but I tell you folks, leopard fur is a lot more coarse than you think it is. It's a lot tougher. It's not as... And the belly may be nice and soft, but it's very, 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 very coarse. Like, um, not a shaggy dog, like a very hard fur type of dog. I'm trying to think what kind of dog... Oh, sorry, boy. You're right there. He's just stopped in the shade. And... Uh, I'll also warn you that the smell that you'll generate on your hands after snuggling with a leopard like this is going to be quite something to behold. Well, it seems like Sydney has either gone somewhere else or he's moved to the Juma Den and he's got a very special surprise. I am so very lucky this afternoon by the Juma Den. As yesterday I was here looking for them and there was nothing. But today, oh, look, the, the smallest one is coming now. I haven't seen the smallest one for a long time. Look at that. This is beautiful. Oh, the other one is pulling the small one from the ear. So they are very much inquisitive. The mother is just looking everywhere. So I'm sure this is the mother for these adults, one's pretty. So the smallest one I can see there now, she's going high up, looking from the high elevation. So the small one is very much interested uh, to play. So these hyenas, they keep moving these little ones away because of the following reasons. One, they don't want other predators in the area to detect the scent of their little ones. Two, when there is high infestations of parasites such as fleas, they've got to move their little ones. So there is quite a lot of competition going on amongst these predators, as predators such as wild dogs, when they come to these areas, when they're babies, they will eat their little ones. Same applies to the hyenas. When they come across the other den sites for other predators, they also eat their little ones. So that helps them in order to minimize the competition in these areas. So in order to see the kill, in in order to see the kill, we've got to sometimes depend on these kind of animals because they have good sense of smell and they can smell blood from a long distance. So I am also very much happy that the hyenas are back at Juma as it was difficult a few weeks ago to see them. They were gone to the other side. You can see now that the mother is now walking around us uh, trying to check what's happening. But I can see they are not having any stress about our presence. The little ones also are interested to follow their mother in order to show us the area. Oh, the little one, other one is down already. You can see wanting to follow the uh, mother at the moment. So these little ones are growing very fast. So look, they are very much interested on in play. So the smallest one, which is still very dark, got disappear. As in Plonk is growing, I have seen that first time I'm seeing them for quite a long time. I can see that they're growing very quickly now. Oh, I can see that little one is going to follow. The mother is somewhere resting under the tree there. 
So the sun is a bit hot at the moment, so that's why now they are moving much more to the other side. So I'm going to have to uh, change the position so that I can give you the better sighting. Oh, this one is coming back again. <laughs> it doesn't want me to move. So this termite mound, which is used as a den site, it has got the two holes. At the back, there's another entrance. So they've got two entrances at the moment. So sometimes when these holes are too open, a big predators such as leopard can go in. Not long time ago, we have witnessed it when a Tristan was lucky with a Tingana going deep and completely disappeared in one of the termite mounds. So that is a sign that when the predators are in the area, can easily go down and get hold of these little ones. And this is so cute, look at that. Look at those beautiful spots. It's unbelievable that when these little ones are still young, the color is completely different just like what we saw earlier when the little one came out. So if you can compare Plonk and the a small one, you will see that they don't look uh, the same. <laughs> uh, Mina, they look very funny, especially when looking at the body design. Having long legs and short hind legs then makes it much more interesting. They just want to sniff every time. Look at that. You can see that little one is trying to pick up the scent from the, the wind because there's too much wind at the moment. Maybe the wind is bringing them updates. Very much inquisitive. The ears are moving all the time. Uh, the question about the termites collapsing is very much rare. I have seen the big animals such as the elephants. You must check. These termites have got entrances. Entrances are not done mostly by these hyenas. These entrances are done by the animals such as the artifacts. And the hyenas, they just come and use them and modify them in order to get better so that they can easily go inside. But the elephants, they can weigh up to 5,000 kilograms. Elephants can be able to climb up here and feed from the trees while standing on top of the termite mound. It's very rare for a termite mound to get dissolved. Also, when it's raining too much, they don't easily get dissolved. So the materials which is used in order to build the termites, the termite mounds by the termites is interesting. They build these kind of big houses from their saliva and their droppings. So they've got kind of a sticky glue which helps them in order to stick this kind of soil. And it becomes very much hard. If you go and knock there, you're going to feel that this is very much hard. It's like a rock and it's very rough on the outside and smooth by the inside. So hyenas are part of those animals who got to be uh, thankful when it comes to uh, the utilization of the holes dug by the artifact. So while I'm still checking what is going to happen around here, let's go to David by the Masai Mara, who is lucky with the lions. Well done. Uh, hyena cubs are pretty good to watch in an afternoon. And we got cubs here, but be sure, before we show you those cubs, we got a very thirsty lioness here who is drinking. Now, this one member is a member of the Sausage Tree Pride, and I feel full of joy to have spotted them finally. I've been looking for them for the last couple of three hours. Not sure who this is, and my guess is this is the very famous King Tail. Kingtail is the oldest female in this particular pride. And the other day, or is it yesterday morning, she introduced us to her 
three cabs and how exiting is that? Well, for those of you who have never joined us before, I got a very special pair of lions here. And I'm saying special because it's my favorite pride. In the matter, we've got loads of prides of lions, very many, over 10 prides. But this particular one, I follow them with a passion because of their dynamics. Now, I'm going to show you Kingtail as she's walking down towards her two cubs. I'm sure those cubs could be hiding for her to do what you call hide and seek. Very good job, Archie. Archie's the camera operator with me this afternoon. But if you look carefully in the grass there where Kingtail is facing, her 12 o'clock, two small little cubs hiding in the grass. Not small, I would guess they're about six months old. And Kingtail is followed by another female behind. I'm yet to identify who she is. Now let's just watch carefully and see what these cubs will do to the auntie. Yep, nice play. A oh, little stretch there. Excellent. That's a stretching of four by four. Child of the Universe, you'd like to see all the cubs together. You stay tuned up, Child of the Universe. But seeing King tell Child of the Universe, I think, is pretty special. And look at those cubs playing with their mother there. And how cool is this? They've come so close to a cub. So Child of the Universe, what I'm doing, these lions are on the move. I do not know where they're going, but chances are they're going to where the other smaller cubs are. And if they end up there, Child of the Universe, I'll be following them there. So stay tuned and you'll see what happens. So what we want to do is to turn around and I'll be more than happy to do that so that then we can cover a bigger audience. Let me just put my head down because Archie doesn't like seeing my head. He likes seeing lions which are just in front of the car and not very far, but what, three meters or four meters from the car? Hello, hello, and jumbo, jumbo, and a very warm welcome to Kenya. We are in a game reserve that is called the Mara Triangle with some very exciting, playful lion cubs. Oops, look at that. They have always said a good picture is worth a thousand words, but uh, seeing these uh, particular cubs in graphics playing is worth, I would guess, a million words. Very windy where we are, but these cubs are not bothered by the blowing air up or down here in the grass. Lynn, you're asking how the tiny cubs are doing. Now, this particular ones here are about six months old, Lynn, and they belong to one of the females here. We haven't seen the tiny cubs the whole of today. Yesterday afternoon, Lynn, we never saw them, but yesterday morning we saw them, and I'm sure you were watching when we saw that small little band of joy trying to walk, and uh, she came very close to the car, and you saw her going, yeah, yeah, and she was calling. So what you're doing will be following uh, these big cubs here because they're following their mother, and if they're going to take us where I'm thinking they will go, we are, will be able to see the smaller cubs, and especially that very small one. Now, Lynn, let me just go very close to, not very close rather, a little closer to these lions, and I'll show you the lead female t and give you an idea of the direction she is going into where I got a feeling there could be the den of uh, Kingtail's cubs and the other one female. Now, look carefully. If Lynn, you look ahead of me, you see that one lion is there? My guess is, that is Mitty. Mitty is one of the lionesses in this particular pride. I haven't seen her closely. If I see her closely, I'll be able to identify her. Of the five females in this pride, she got the darkest or very brown eyes. And she got a small little split on her right nose. Karas, you're saying yes, cabs can turn out to be ferocious. 
ferocious rather as they grow and this is an indication of what will happen to these cubs as they grow older now we have confirmed 100 percent these two cubs here are males of course after about a month, a month and a half, if you look at them carefully and closely be, uh, below their tails, you can tell what sex they are. And these are two boys. Maybe in the eighth, ninth month there, we are going to see small signs of men coming out of the necks. So these are the oldest cub of the Societary Pride. They're about six months old. There's another cub, almost the same age, which is about five months old. And her mother is called Limpy. She isn't here. And of course, that other cub that belongs to Limpy, they're not here, both of them. Now, Kingtail is one female also in this particular Pride that we saw earlier. She got a knot on her tail. That's why we call her Kingtail. And we think she got three cubs. There's one more other female here that had put my mind or my brain in a spin the other day because we have never seen her mating with anybody. We have never seen her pregnant, but one of a very small tiny cub that we think would have been even nine or 10 days old, we saw her yesterday. So we are yet to wait and see her most likely nursing. Now from the position they are in, they're definitely scanning. You can see they're just looking around and scanning, I'm talking of them looking for some dinner. They may spot some animals at the moment, they may spot some prey now, and then later on, they'll take the advantage of the darkness. Now look at that particular one. She is on top of a Taman Mound, and that gives her a vantage point of like 360 degrees to look around and see where buffaloes, for example, could be. Isn't that special? What are you thinking looking to looking at each other? Angel, that's right, we need to have proper identity. And the good news, Angel, we can identify Kingtail 150%. We can identify Miti 150%. And we need to look at them more carefully and we will know who is who. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy that you've been able to watch this with us. And I hope you're all excited, just like me, haven't you? Well, my name, my name is David, and on camera with me was Achi. Please stay on the lookout. We might be sending you more notifications much later on. We're going to give you one more quick look of these particular beautiful lions. And from myself and Achi, many thanks and goodbye. Well, welcome back our regular viewers and I'm sure we are all enjoying this particular sighting here. Now those two cabs are sitting very close to some uh, water there. We have a little stream that flows down there, but they don't seem very thirsty. Not sure they haven't eaten meat, but what would happen is when they eat meat, you'll always see them coming to have a drink. Very interesting. Look at the color of that water. It looks very dark, very mucky. But animals here in the wilderness will always drink that water as it is and they never get issues. Not sure what would happen to me or Archie if you go drink the same water, but it's wonderful the kind of immune system of how or how their bodies work that they can comfortably drink water like this and nothing actually would happen. Well, I'm a happy uh, man today having seen my favorite pride of lions and I think Trish got a lion should want to talk about. I certainly am enjoying my cats. In fact, I wish they were as playful as David had right there. I was just saying to BK, these cubs are hogging all the cat action, but I suppose they're just way too cute. You just can't stop looking at them. Myself even, they are just the most stunning little creatures ever. And imagine that they turn into 
these sort of beasts in five to seven years. It's stunning. So these guys were born in 2013. So they'll be six this year. I don't know if we know the exact month, but definitely 2013. And they'll be their biggest and their mane will be the their sort of darkest and biggest when they're about seven. So maybe there's even more to go. More mane and more size to see. I can't wait to watch them actually. Fiona says their stomachs must be hardened now. I would think so. Although it does look like they haven't really... Yeah, it looks like they haven't eaten. I really hope that they get a kill. You know, with the way that they were sort of mentioning about, I thought that they were. Could the lion's injury have been from a snake bite? What a thought. I actually didn't even think about that. Well, apart from the injury on the actual head, that I suppose could be a fang, but then there would be two puncture wounds. And it looks like a massive puncture wound. But then again, it could have started small and then gotten big. I don't know. He does have a few swelling on some joints as well. I suppose if if he had some sort of snake bite, that could be the case too. But I, I don't know. It seems like it kind of goes through the skull just a bit, or into the skull just a bit. Some of you guys are wondering if a lion would die from a snake bite. I suppose in the same way as a human may die from a snake bite. It doesn't happen often. Most of the time when a, when a snake bites you, you can experience horrible uh, repercussions and that sort of thing, but death is not usually on the cards unless it's something very, very venomous, um, maybe like a black mamba or a boomslang or a vine snake. Even a vine snake, I don't think it can actually kill you, but it will, the venom, there is no anti-venom for it, so you'll just have to kind of suffer through. And I'm pretty sure that most other mammals will also feel the same sort of effects. But the benefit that us humans have is having access to medical care and, of course, anti-venom if and when we need it. Something that these animals don't have. And the other thing is we have people who will bring us food, take us to hospital take care of us, bring us anything we need. And if you're out here in the wild and you're in that situation, most of the time, the best you're going to get is exactly what we're seeing here. You're going to get some guidance from your, your kind of group members. In this case, his coalition. And then apart from that, there's not much else he can do. He can take down a kill, but I don't know if he'd drag it to the brother. He did lead him to some water early on. The water is just actually ahead of us in this little, little patch right there. So he led his brother to some water. Um, but like I said, I think that's the best that can be done. It's not like he can get, get his brother to kind of bandage up or something like that. Well, so I hope he does get better and I really hope it's not a snake bite at all. I really don't. Well, I'm going to stay here. I'm enjoying my time with the cats and the breeze and the grass. In the meantime, let's go to Steve. Mm, it has suddenly gotten a bit warmer. The wind is not as powerful as it was and cats are lying down. Well, we followed him for some time. He's now here in the shade. Perfect ambush position from one watching hole to another. And he's hoping something is going to come down and drink. But we are going to stay right here so we don't miss any of the action. 
It doesn't look like he's going to be giving any action for any time, any time soon. But uh, needless to say, we are with him and we will remain so. The Duke of Juma. Don't forget, folks, we are live and we have got many questions and answers for you. Well, you got the questions, we got the answers. Please feel free to send them through on hashtag Safari Live or drop them on the YouTube chat stream. Let us know what you'd like to talk about with regards to Tigana here, of course. Emma, if you could just let Trishala know that someone's trying to get her on the game drive radio, please. That would be awesome. It's really nice after the rain. Nice sunshine coming out. <laughs> Hello, right? You want to know what survival advantage spotted fur has for leopards? Well, essentially it makes them extremely camouflaged. And well, when you're a young cub trying to avoid detection from larger predators that might see to do you harm, well, you can hide away. But also a leopard uses its spots for camouflage to sneak up as close as possible. Um, if the leopard was only white, it's a very good chance that it would not be able to sneak up or be stealthy at all. It would just stand out very clear but it's really incredible how well camouflaged a leopard really is. Um, but bearing in mind the herbivores and the prey animals out here, they, they, they see with a black and white vision. So they actually don't, be, they're not able to pick out much of the sort of definition of a cat. And what the spots do, they break up the outline. And what black and white visioned animals are need to do is they need to basically be able to see an outline it's all about outline and they get a shape, sort of an image. That's why when a leopard sticks its head over a termite mound, it flattens its ears so that it blends in with the termite mound. But animals are looking for a specific shape. And uh, it's the same with predators. They are looking for a shape. They don't really see definition. And Yala and Kudu and the like, they are able to break up their, th their 3D shape with uh, the, the stripes and the fur that they have on their body. And I was actually... I witnessed a little bit of research taking place in a reserve, uh, some American university, I forget the name, we were trying to test a theory with lions that were there, and they were dragging these cut-out cardboard sort of things of impala behind the car, and the lions were reacting to it. They were chasing these cardboard cutouts because of the shape. So it's quite incredible. Um, it's all about search image, and that's why a leopard's and lions don't really pay attention to us in a car. They get used to the fact that we are part of the car. But if I stood up and got out the car, they'll see that shape that is me. And, well, not necessarily me, but that is associated with humans. And humans to leopards and lions and most other animals is regarded as danger. As we evolved with them on the African plains. And we were very, very adept hunters and gatherers. And we used to fight uh, for our place in the system. But right now, Tingana is not doing anything. Okay, well, it seems like David is with the cats that are playing around. Let's go back up to him with a world of cuteness. It's very typical for cats to be flat sometimes, as Tingana is doing now. But the very opposite of this different species of cats that I got here. And you can see how playful they are. Now, a third cat that I had not seen before just came and joined, not knowing there was another lioness elsewhere. And I guess that one other lioness must have been Limpy, because Limpy got one cub that's about five months old. So I got four females here and three cubs. I've stopped here, just watch them, where they're going. But I've got a feeling the direction they're going into, there's a little forest ahead of them, and that's where most likely the den of one other female that's not here, which I think have the youngest and the smallest tiny cub, is, and she could be denning her one cub, and King Tail's a three cow king tail is another female here that we call her by that name because she got a knot on her tail for those of you who could be joining us now. This has two of those girls 
And again, if you look carefully, they are a bit raised from the ground, small little tumid mount, and the whole idea is to scum. That's what they do when it's not very hot, when they're out of the shed. And once they identify the prey, then they will make strategies and plans on how to hunt. I only guess they could be going for a buffalo and not anything else. Look at the background and see the cloud that's hanging there. Beautiful, beautiful. And those are the plains of the Mara Triangle. We'll always have tree lines along the Lagos. And yes, um, in the final control system, that's quite stunning. And that's one advantage of seeing where we are. Fiona, you'd like to know why they are called the Big Five. There have been a few theories of how that phrase was con coined, Fiona. And I would say, number one, way back, we had hunters. When hunting was very big in Africa, we had hunters coming all over, out, all over the world. I mean, from all over the world, from the US, I mean, from North America, Europe, and they would come and hunt animals. And one of the theories, or, you know, how they ended up with that phrase is, they're the animals that they would hunt for trophies. So buffaloes, for example, they would hunt them for the huge racks of horns and they used to do the bigger or the wider the horn the bigger or the value of the trophy was today that might have changed a little bit because what they do they look at how wide uh, the base of the horn is on what they call vol volumetrics and that's more in the males they didn't used to hunt females but if the females had huge horns that could come out that could be one reason of course lions they would definitely be hunting the male the males, as you go back to those lions there, Fiona, because of the men. Leopards, the beautiful skins with their rosettes. Rhinos, there was always that myth, you know, uh, rhinos had some of their Jurassic, you know, properties on their horns. And what have I forgotten of the big five? And what else? Of course, the elephants, Fiona, because of the ivory and ivory makes wonderful carvings ivory makes carvings that they that live for thousands of thousands of years before they way out that's one of the uh reasons why they call it the big five and then number two fiona this to me are some of the most dangerous animals that we got in africa so those two reasons that's how they ended up calling them the big five it's one lioness that's still staying back as the others are still walking away. They're walking, stopping, looking, and the cubs, as usual, are baying, playful, when it cools off like this. And the one that's leading the pride is just moving in that direction towards those trees there. And as I said earlier, my guess is this could be Mitty, and Mitty have pretty small cubs, about six weeks old, and I this time to go do a bit of suckling for the cubs. But of course, like any other mother, you do not want to be staying so long away from your little cubs. Well, these ones here, they have joined the three of them together and it's time to strengthen their muscles and hoping one day they'll become very good hunters. Well, now I can manage to follow them closely and find out where they want to go so that I do not lose their sight and Sydney might have moved from the hyenas. I am now heading much more towards the central part of the reserve just to go and try to see if I cannot be lucky with Kalamba. I have been here yesterday. It was difficult. There was no luck on Kalamba. Maybe this afternoon is going to be my lucky day. There's just quite a lot of elephant tracks everywhere. Maybe these elephants are going to push Kalamba out for me. <laughs> So I left the hyena den because the hyenas just got disappeared. They all went in there and relaxed. So there was no sighting anymore. So that is why I had to leave the den. I will maybe go back again afterwards. So with the rain drizzling every night, it's difficult to see the fresh tracks on these cats. So the potholes, they are getting very deep.
the uh, big five animals as uh, David ignited the topic earlier on. Those animals, that category, is that a category of the animals which were giving the hunters a big problem during the olden days. During the olden days when people were still depending on hunting for survival, they were having serious problems when it comes to the category of the big five. In other words, it's animals that always retaliate when coming across the human beings. So I'm very sure what modified the behavior on those animals to be aggressive towards us as humans is they have realized human was becoming their biggest enemy. And that is normal. If you can check until today, in the areas where there is some uh, both legal and illegal hunting, the behavior of animals get modified. And every time they pick a human scent, they become wary and always got prepared for a fight. So this area where I'm passing now, from yesterday, I'm picking up very strong smell left behind by the hippopotamus. So hippopotamus are some of those animals which can be able to travel long distances. So it means this is their grazing area. So there's even old tracks of these hippos in this area. So now let's uh, quickly go back to one of those animals who does retaliate when coming across a people if you're too close, the leopard. Well, you're back indeed to the sleeper, the Tingana, who is an expert sleeper. And while we've spent many an hour watching him sleep, he's not as animated as Hosanna is when Hosanna sleeps. When Hosanna sleeps, he is um, always moving a leg or there's it's a face moving, there's something going on. But Tingana is dreaming sweet, sweet dreams that seem to be very pleasant. What do you think, folks, that he's dreaming? If you were the Duke of Juma, what do you think would be going on in your mind? Hashtag Safari Live, if you have any thoughts and comments about what you think Tingana might be dreaming as he slumbers there in the lovely shade. Oh, wonderful. I can hear an orange-breasted bush shark in the background. Good time to do some birding. <whistles> it's me mimicking it. <whistles> Rattling cysticular calling. Some arrow-marked babblers with their characteristic loud babbling cackle that they do. A number of starlings have been flying through. And I can also hear a grey-headed sparrow, that high chip, chip, chip sound. I'm not very good at a sparrow's call. Hmm, he could be dreaming about birds. Or maybe he's dreaming about one of those kudu that he didn't catch. You know one of those dreams you have when you're trying to grab something or catch something that you could just never get it, it's always just out of grasp. It must happen to leopards because they miss a lot. You know, everybody looks at leopards and thinks about how successful they are. But um, very often they miss, only with about a 20% success rate. Joe and Linda, you reckon Impala? Yeah, I reckon there's definitely Impala on the brain. Definitely Impala. Maybe he's thinking about how nice those two Steinbock would have been earlier that he missed. Have you seen him with a Steinbock, Seb? I haven't seen him with a Steinbock. I've seen Tundi with a few. And um, Tingana has been with many a Dacre. Whether he caught it or not is debatable. He's stolen them from his ex-wife. <laughs> I do wonder, though, if um, the mating that went on between Tandi and Tingana a few weeks ago is going to lead is going to lead to any sort of um, cubs from Tandi. We haven't seen her in at least a week and a half. Arizona, he's dreaming of younger days. Well, Seb and I were commenting when we saw him before in the shade. He um, 
he was definitely looking a little bit more disheveled around the head and neck, around the ears. You can't really notice it now, but he was really, really close to us at the time. And we got right up on him, on him and he's just looking really, really sort of haggard. He's still looking in fine condition, but the fur around his, around his face uh, is just starting to really start losing its sort of beauty. Uh, lots of ticks, almost a little bit of mange developing around the head. Uh, but it's not as obvious now that he's lying down. But we had a really good view of him before, before he started napping. So 13 years old, somewhere around there. He's a very good age for male leopard. I mean, Mvula was looking also quite scraggly um, last year. I only saw him once last year. He was looking quite, quite skinny and thin. Uh, he'd lost a lot of fur. He lost a lot of condition. Never seen him in his prime days, but he was a magnificent leopard, um, so I was told seen some images and uh, that is the way with all these big cats is they hold on to it as long as they can and unfortunately once retirement sets in they do diminish quite quickly but everybody out there seems to think and agree that he's got at least another year in him which is very very possible the way he's going I mean he's he's gone from having a shrunken territory last year to pushing even further this year and last year into Torchwood and Bufusuk and other areas we don't even know. But anyway, it seems as if the Avoca boys have decided to get a little bit of a spring in their step. Let's go and see if they're going to get up to anything interesting. Yes, my cat has started to move just a bit, but not gotten off the ground, unfortunately. But the head has picked up. Now there's a bit of scratching going on. And he rolled onto his back, and then his brother rolled onto his back. So there's a lot of contagious behavior going on here. So I wonder if brother will start scratching soon. Nope. He's just knocked out. And I actually got quite excited when he rolled over because it looked like he had this huge belly. And I was like, whoa, you've had a great meal. But it is, in fact, not his belly. Have a closer look, and you can see that it's actually his rib cage, And you can see that well-defined sort of V right there where you can see the breath in and the breath out yeah so he doesn't look well fed he just looks like he's got a great big pair of ribs he does look awfully comfortable though for someone who's unfed maybe his brother right there might be able to Oh, hunt something and then they could share it. Yes, these boys probably are also dreaming of food like Tingana. Well, one is definitely dreaming of food. The other one is actually trying to plan how to get it. <laughs> He's being slightly more productive. Interestingly, I read about um, dreaming in mammals and whether they actually have the ability to dream. And it was found that almost all mammals go through a stage of REM sleep even if it's just a couple minutes so the potential to dream is there and what their dreams contain who knows most likely food I would say the basic functions food chasing running walking smelling something I would think that sort of thing. The other night I dreamt of donuts. Just to put that in perspective. Yes, I dream of donuts, you dream of kudu. It actually was a good dream until I entered this, um, it was sort of like a 24 hour, you know, convenience store kind of thing. And then there was a big sign that said no donut Tuesdays. Now why on earth would you put on a sign that said no donut Tuesdays? Usually you'd be advertising the donuts. And then I was very upset. And then the lady said, no, I'll make you a donut. And then she brought the donut to me and then it fell on the ground. <laughs> it's true. I don't know what my subconscious is doing to me. So if that's the type of dreams I am having, can you imagine what these guys must be having? They almost see a big sign that says kudu here. And then they get there and it's, it's empty.
Oh, imagine if it said that no Impala Monday, how upset would you be? I'm sure you would be really upset. Oh, get that spot, get that spot. Now, this guy here, you know, it's always hard kind of to tell exactly which one is which when you have them singly. But when you have them together, it's much easier. Uh, yours is the special one more, uh, to the back. So, uh, now seeing the both of them, I can positively identify that that guy there is definitely the mohawked male or snarly. When he opens his mouth, you can see that his bottom incisors are all sort of crooked. And that is a defining characteristic of him. And that only leaves the blonde male and the dark maned male. And he's the injured one is definitely not a dark maned male. So I would say this is blondie and mohawk slash snarly. So dark maned male is still a wall at this point. Huh? David is following the sausages. I bet these guys would dream of sausages. In the meantime, let's go to him. Very good, uh, Trish, to identify the avocamels, because for me, there's something, the thickets there that you cannot see. And that's where the king to lioness just entered. And what I would want to tell you for a fact, I would guess that is her new den, because where she was previously is about a mile from, yeah, about, yeah, just about a mile or so from where she is now. I've been following her for the last 10 minutes, and she just came and she entered somewhere here. I'm actually going to show you that particular place right now, and she has not moved. And you can tell, or you can say that's her den because of how thick it is. There's a bit of a depth or a ditch, and that's a very ideal place to hide cubs. So that is, I would guess, her second uh, den after she moved uh, her cubs from the first place where she gave birth to them. And once in a while, Leonesses will always move the cubs once in a while to avoid detection from cubs. I mean, to, to avoid detection from predators, for example, what? Isaac got. Well, welcome back. I'm here with the North Clan. The North Clan is a clan of hyenas that has been studied here for quite a good number of years. They have their main matriarch called Waffles. She is not present but she is very well presented by plenty and plenty of cubs of different ages. This one here, I don't know his name, he's a new member of the North Clan, uh, only about three and a half, four months, uh, so I don't know his name, but um, in the next coming months we'll be able to tell you what they have named him. Yes, you can tell, they're all well rested, Remember to join me in conversation. I will be here for the rest of the time, so please join me in the conversation. I'm putting my low, my voice low, so that I don't disturb them. They are rather quite shy, these little guys. Um, you can um, chat to me on hashtag Safari Life, or you can watch me on YouTube live stream. Um, I'm at the Wolf, you know North Clan Den, and this is a den that has got plus minus over 60 members yes there are 60 members over 60 members in this clan that female there uh, i think she's the babysitter she has been left to take care of the youngsters to me if you don't ask me i will um tell you that over here you can tell Yes, uh, Waffles is still very much the leader. Nothing has changed. I did my study well last night. And uh, yes, she's still the main leader. Her daughter, 
um, passed, one of the daughters passed away and Soup, the th third daughter, has given birth and they are, I think some of the cubs here belong to her and I think she will be the one to take over from Waffles once she's you know, ready to hand over the leadership. I think it wouldn't come easy but at old age she will be able to, she will you know, have no otherwise but to hand over. Carl Six, you were wondering about the North Clan. Here they are. I'm glad you were patient enough because we are also wondering exactly what had happened. But due to rains, they had they had moved their dens twice, so it was quite rather difficult to follow them. We don't have the tracking device to follow Waffles, who's got um, the collar, uh, who's got a collar, and uh, we don't have the tracking device to follow her. So for us, we have to follow her manually and follow them manually. So eventually, we found this there not even a week ago. So we're very, very grateful and happy. The vehicle you just saw, it belongs to the Hyena Research Project. Um, they have the permission to be much, much closer than the normal distance. So don't you worry, the um, people who know what they're doing. And actually, I think they're going to come up with a lot of new study about this beautiful predator. Um, hyenas are perceived to be, you know, I've always said this, you know, dirty, you know, scrungy, um, mean, but um, it is actually a very, um, I, I like them, I, a very, you know, successful predator. It does make most of its skills and are much more active than other predators, you know. They will always be moving, they will always be doing something, unlike, you know, leopard or uh, lion, if you find them eating, after eating, you know, they'll just lay rest. These guys, you know, are always very active. There's a little guy who's way back there, and I think he's chewing on a cow, on an old, you know, hide, maybe from a hippo, from a uh, buffalo. I can imagine how hard it is. It's like chewing an old boot. <laughs> you need to have lots of saliva and very sharp teeth. So, yeah, yes, actually, actually, it's like a shoe toy. Yeah, so actually, I think uh, that's what he's doing. They are the only few predators that will be able to eat those kind of hard stuff, you know, skins, bones. And that one there is taking care of an old skin. This den here, um, I was here last night, and there were two that were really... Oh, there we go, there's, there, there's, there's the waffles. Wah, eh, wah, yes. Oh, she was just finding there. Look at her. Nice. Oh, how wonderful to see her. Yeah, she's actually getting quite old, you can tell. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. This is just awesomeness. Well, you know, she's a good leader, as you can tell. She's given the other females confidence to breed. And so that's why, you know, we like her. She's got lots and lots of um, daughters, and all the daughters have given birth. So this is a huge, huge family. Yeah, yes. I'm so happy, you know, that everybody is happy to see Waffles. Yes, you know, we were quite worried, but um, uh, don't you worry anymore. We have her, and she's well, as you can see, and she's still in charge. I think she's babysitting today, because yesterday I came and she wasn't here. So it's really, really great to see her, and looks like everybody is very, very healthy over here. And today, actually, there's not much tension that last night. Last night I came here, if in case you didn't join me, and there was a bit of tension. There were some cubs that couldn't come out of the den because every time they put their heads out, there's a babysitter who, you know, walked towards the den and they would run quickly towards the hole. So I don't know exactly what um, what was going on. But today, grandmother is around, so all is well you can tell you know there's a little one if you zoom in to the right a little bit there jandre you'll see there's a little one popping in there there uh, yeah there see that there's another little one cute <laughs> yeah i think this one is still um not confident enough to come out so you see it's gone back <laughs> Yeah, 
Yes, you know, while I sit here with this nice spotted um, hyenas, let me let me take you to some more spotted animals down in Juma. Yay, waffles! Waffles we haven't seen in ages. Easy to identify though, isn't she, Isaac? I know he was having a chat last night about, he's not sure if you'd ID her, but it's very easy when you see that collar. Very, very easy indeed. I like it when he says that well, all the hyenas are well behaved while grandma's watching. <laughs> Does it remind you all a little bit of your upbringing? I mean, um, <laughs> did you behave with grandma or were you, were you a bit more naughty with grandma? My grandma was, was pretty strict. Many grandparents, though, generally because they might have been a strict mom or dad, are generally quite relaxed with their kids, aren't they? With their grandkids, spoil them a little bit more, seeing as that they don't have to be the doting parent. Oh, we've got an elephant over there. That's what he was looking at, sir. A herd of elephants just crossing the road in front of us. There we go. He had his head up. He's having a look at something. Something moved and, well, he realized there was an elephant and, well, that's well beyond his reach of capabilities. Oh, it's floppy ear. Hello, floppy ear. There's also grandma right there, I would say. A nice herd of them coming out into the open. Yes, they are. That is the way it works. You just have to spend enough time in one place and you will, all the animals will come out. It's all about patience. I once spent three whole days at a watering hole. We had a little bit of a chalet there or a little, a very rudimentary bungalow. And we saw probably about 20 different rhinos, three different lions, two packs of wild dog. Well, they were the same pack of wild dogs. We had jackal, we had hyena, elephant, all came out to the water. All you do is you just sit and wait and eventually the resource of the watering hole will attract the animals down if you have the patience. Highly recommend doing that just with a few friends. A nice quiet weekend away. Very, very cool in the African wilderness with fires, of course, and the night sky. Those of you who haven't been out to Africa, that is one of the highlights of being out in here is the evening sounds and the beautiful stars that we have out in these very non-populated areas lacking pollution. Hello, Little. You want to know why the SABC show is stopping? Well, it's a 13-part series, and tonight is episode 13. So once the season's done, then obviously um, successes and failures will be addressed, and then, um, but we're pitching, or I think we are scheduled to do a second one starting on the 7th of April. They're busy negotiating the finer points of that, I do believe. Um, but a season is a season, and it has to come to an end at some point. And uh, we did seven, uh, 13 uh, episodes, even though there was a bit of a gap in the middle for some cricket. Those of you who don't understand cricket, you, <laughs> you wouldn't really know. But um, it's all about um, finishing a season and then off it starts again. Just like the binge series, that was a series as well with a number of episodes. The last one we did as well, the gauntlet series also. I can't remember how many we did, but there's a finite number that are allocated to a series or a season and then you do another one which is very very cool we're very excited for our final episode and that's why we've spent so much time with tingana today because well, we don't want to lose him the duke has to have the final word you see on the end of the sabc3 uh, first season for the safari live and hopefully the evoker males will stay as well for the show they're going a little bit east hopefully they don't go too far north well it's in trisha's hands to keep up with them Yes, they were sticking around, but right now have decided to move off. Ah, there they are. BK, can you see them? There we go. They've just had the most wonderful thing. They've, the wind's been blowing in their face and their manes have sort of just been blowing. It looks like a, like a magazine shoot, to be very honest. And they just kind of had their noses up, remember? If the wind is blowing into them, then they can smell everything else that's been collected up by the wind. So maybe they're out in the hunt. Who knows? Here they come. Past us. It was just the most stunning scene. Absolutely stunning scene. 
I'm going to try to roll a bit forward. No, the car won't let me. Of course not. Nikki would like to know if the wind helps to keep flies away. Um, I haven't ever thought about it for lions, but I do know that, um, I mean, when we have mosquitoes in the camp, one thing I really do do is put the fan on and it really does help with the, with the mosquitoes and I suppose any flying, uh, flying insect to be honest, and I'm sure the wind kind of helps them. But I can't imagine if something's stuck in their mane that it does too much. I think the main purpose for them is to be able to smell everything that's coming up with that wind. They really are magnificent. But can you see the ridges of his spine along there? Now we do have other people in the sighting, of course. So that's the other vehicle that you are seeing. It's a bit harder to maneuver around, but nonetheless, everyone wants to get a good sighting of these two, especially since we haven't seen them together for a while, or at least these guys haven't as well. So just make sure my game drive radio is up. Oh, you can still see them in front there. Now, can you see the way that brother uh, is kind of Oh, I can hear something funny in my ear, Emma. <laughs> um, you can see the way that the brothers are kind of following each other and they have this really strong bond going on. And this is something so precious to see, I think. Oh, it is very, very windy now. I'm going to try and get around here and see if we can get a bit of a better view. Luckily, it's not too thick around here. There actually are some open spaces to get in. Now, where are you two? Ah, there they are. Again, they're kind of catching the wind, how's it? They're kind of just catching the wind and it looks absolutely stunning. Now, he has one right here. Beautiful. BK, I don't know if you can actually see them there with all the sun and the wind. There we go. Now, I can't... Having a few comms issues, but I heard the word David, David. So, uh, let's go to David. <laughs> well, I moved out and followed one lioness who I believe was Mitty, and she took me about 300 meters from where I am. And I guess that's where Mitty got her full caps. Now, this is the spot I was earlier, if you can remember that broken tree where Kingtail went in. Kingtail is one of the females in this particular parade. Well, after having Mitty gone in a ditch that I could not see anything or even her tail, I thought, let me come back to these two other girls. Well, one of them is limpy because, of course, her cub is here and the other female that you don't have a name who got two cubs. But now, this one's luckily, they have stayed out. Do you hear that? Because I've just had a small little call from one of the cubs, and I think that's one of the king tails cubs. And should it have a distress, that's why you saw that particular lion, lioness react like that. But I think all should be fine, eh? So she's going to watch that direction where we could not see king tail. And of course, the other female there, who I guess to be limpy, has all the three cubs and they're just grooming, which is very typical of lions. I'm so happy at least these two mothers and these three cubs have remained outside the den because if they would have joined Kingtail, that would be a bit, uh, that would be a toughie for me to be able to see them in that little hidden, uh, I would say, 
Did you want to move a little closer? So what you want to do, just move a little bit closer and see if Kingtail might come out. And I think by the time she came here, she must have spent enough time maybe suckling those cubs. She could be coming out any time. So let me just give a different angle. Are you happy there, Archie? Okay, just keep moving. Now, the wind is still blowing. Nothing has changed, but it's not as strong. Wow. Well, I would say it's more or less the same as when we started, because I can hear it holding in my ears. And unlike the buffaloes that we saw earlier, which looked, you know, to be anxious of the wind, in general, lions don't get bothered by the wind. This is very good. Now, I think today is a day for predators and wind, and I think also Isaac is in the wind, but with different predators. Well, I'm still here um, with the North Clan, and they all see, seem to be attracted by something in the long grass there. They do what is called pasting, where um, their anal glands will secrete a certain type of pasty substance and they would apply it into the grass. And that is a sort of a way of communicating to one another, especially with clan members. And they were sniffing the long grass over there and I thought maybe another, you know, another clan member came across here and pasted it because they all got very interested and they moved there. You can tell that everybody is hanging around Granny Waffles herself. In case you're joining us for the first time, this is called the North Clan. It's a clan of hyenas that has been studied for quite some time by um, University of California in America and they've been following them for more than I think about 10 years and they know quite a lot. The oldest female she's called Waffles and she's got a daughter called Soup. Most of Soup daughters are named after different kinds of soups like mushroom, like uh, what else do we have, you know, um, parcel, like um, um, what else, carrot soup, uh, they, they named after, you know, different names. So in the coming months, I will be able to show them to you and to give them the names uh, of who is who. But um, unlike what it is written in the books where, you know, the matriarch is the only one that gives birth, you know, the hyenas here, haven't read those books and they don't know to follow that here there is a lot of cubs so it tells me it is not only you know waffles who gives birth also the other you know females give birth so it has broken the rules and you can tell these two are maybe the same age yes you know while I sit here and enjoy this lovely cute cubs let me tend send you to Trish who's got a beautiful lion our oh, wonderful lions you have made a special appearance for us today are in fact the stars to take us to the end of the show super excited as always I'm always super excited aren't I it's just because I love these things they're just so pretty absolutely beautiful and today's relationship, I don't know how many times I've turned around to Beak and gone, Oh, oh, did you see that? Because it's just stunning. And with the green and the wind and the way it all just blows into their mane, actually leaves me a bit speechless. But obviously with this job, you can't be speechless. No, no. Except right there, I was speechless. Look at that. Child of the Universe says this was a great drive for a Sunday. I think so too. Oh, I'm so glad Tingana has made an appearance. We've got the second Avoka male come in. I just think it was wonderful. And we had the cubs. We had the sausage tree pride. We had their cubs. The hyena cubs. Oh, it's just been... 
beauty, absolute beauty. And the sun is slowly setting here in South Africa. slowly setting over our beautiful lions of course we do have our sabc show season finale in half an hour and you can guys can of course catch that on youtube and you are so welcome to we love to have our regular viewers on board always a pleasure i'm glad they've decided to settle down again again they didn't walk long they were just he led his brother here and he said here brother have a rest before we're off again so they'll sit out the sunset here and it'll set behind them just beautifully and as the sun sets on our lovely lions the sun sets of course on our drive this afternoon Thank you so much for your questions and comments. Don't forget, you can join us on the YouTube channel in half an hour for the SABC show as well. But for now, bye-bye.